Welcome to the Startup Grind. I think uh, typically, like uh, for all our clients, I would, uh, you know, ask you to kind of just start with your background. Just give your background, what you have done, about your family, about your education, what kind of work that you have done, what you've been, you know, uh, what you've been through. Sure. <laughs> okay, so um, so as Mahesh said, I mean, so in terms of sort of on my qualifications and all, I think Mahesh did a great job covering it. I, I went from undergrad to National Law School in Bangalore, uh, joined McKinsey right after as a consultant, uh, did a lot of work in healthcare and education while at McKinsey, um, specifically worked in scaling um, uh, and, and, and basically scaling out um, two causes that, uh, and two sort of organizations I, I really learned a lot from. So one was the Gates Foundation, so I developed a national nutrition strategy. The National Child Nutrition Strategy. And the other one was EMRI, which is the 108 Ambulance Service Provider. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It's actually in um, a part of states now, and we started off consulting for them. They were literally in two states, and we just started off operations in the second state. We developed that role and sort of actually rolled up our sleeves and worked with them in, in, in scaling them out to the states they are in today. I went on to join the Public Health Foundation of India for a year, uh, where I worked with the president of the foundation um, on organization uh, building, on hiring, on uh, organization restructuring, fundraising, building on centers of excellence. Uh, I went on to Harvard to do my MBA. Uh, and I went on, I was fortunate enough, and I think that really dearest my choice to be an entrepreneur after my MBA, I went on to fellowships. I went on the Fulbright Fellowship and the J and Tata Endowment. Um, and I worked for a year before moving back to India to start up Baby Chakra. So that's sort of my, you know, like my CV. <laughs> uh, now who I am and what my experiences have been as a person and I was sharing this with Mahesh and Atul. So, um, uh, so I grew up in Calcutta. Uh, I don't know how many folks here are from, yay, okay, we need to talk. So, <laughs> no, so I grew up in Calcutta uh, and I actually grew up in my formative years in the districts of Bengal because my mom was in the IAS. And I've actually had a very, very strong, um, you know, sort of a woman role model in my own family, right? I've actually seen her sort of um, stand in front of rioters, sort of deal with policemen, tell them how to sort of, um, you know, deal with riots. And I've grown up learning a lot from her leadership style. And that's been very, very strong. Um, and, you know, sort of, it's been a very strong influence for me. Um, so that sort of, I think that sort of molded um, also, sort of the, the decisions I've taken over time, um, um, sort of taking chances, never really thinking I, why, like I'm second best to anyone, uh, you know, sort of putting myself out there, and, and I think we'll touch more on that as we go along. Yeah, sure. So, uh, can you talk about, uh, you know, uh, why you were doing law, uh, you know, you met this for the president and all that. So that, that was very inspiring. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so that was. Um, let me just put some context, right? So I, uh, like this is when I was what, nine, uh, 19, 20 years old. I'm at National Law School Bangalore, which is actually one of the most liberal uh, colleges you'll find uh, for your undergrad education in India. Uh, and I would argue almost internationally as well. It's very, very liberal, very progressive. Um, the day I stepped into the law school campus, I knew I wanted to be the president of the Student Bar Association. I don't know what it was. I just wanted to sort of be the president. I just knew that's what I wanted to be. So I, I kind of said that I need to be class rep, I need to sort of, you know, repress the student body, all of that stuff. So I did all of that for three years. In the fourth year, when it came to standing for president, I put in my nomination papers, and I had, uh, and, and the person who was standing opposite me was this guy from my batch, incredibly popular, lovely fellow. Um, but I got a lot of messages from, from my friends and from my batchmates saying that, um, you know, he's a guy, let him stand, you can support him through the journey. And it was very odd, it was very mm -hmm. at odds with the experience that I had so far. It was interesting. Um, so I was sharing with, uh, with Mahesh Nadul, I think that sort of uh, made me even more determined that <laughs> I'm not going to be second to anyone, I don't want to be vice president. I came in thinking I want to be president, I want to be president. So I gave it my all and, uh, and it was a close call, it was a close election. Um, I, I also shared with them that over time I did lose a couple of friends, or so-called friends along the way, but then I think that's, um, I think when you want something really badly, you have to realize you're not running a popularity contest. You're doing, you're doing stuff you really believe in and you need to just get out there and, and, and be the best you can be, right? So um, yeah, I mean, it's not easy. Um, and I think as, 
I think many times as women we hold ourselves back, we like, take it, it's fine, you know, like this time let this person take over. It doesn't matter, you know, it's fine. But every time we do that, it adds up. Uh, so don't do that. <laughs> like don't let even one instance come that way unless unless you really feel the other person is more deserving than you, or unless you really feel that this is not the correct time for you to do that. So uh, typically not a lot of lawyers uh, take up a McKinsey job. So what was about McKinsey that really excited you to take up? So you know Mahesh, I didn't know anything about McKinsey when I applied. <laughs> so when McKinsey came on campus, um, you know, they all these like smartly dressed men and women came on like in our uh, in the conference room at, at NLS and uh, they talked about sort of just the work they did and that's what really inspired me. So the fact that I could work with um, with large foundations, I could work with governments, I could work with large corporate entities, just the sort of the, the, the variety of work I could do and, and more importantly the kind of impact that they talked about that they were creating, right? The fact that they were making strategies that affected people at scale, that really called out to me and that really appealed to me. So um, I would say when McKinsey came, it wasn't so much, I mean, I don't know so much about the brand name or whatever. It just sounded, it just sort of really appealed to me. And I think the other thing that really helped me make that call was I also had a law firm offer uh, in London, one of the Magic Circle law firms. And um, I, I wrote to them and I said, I want to defer this offer. They were like, are you sure? I was like, absolutely. Let me try this out for a year. Let me see how it goes. And, and, it, and it went really well. So I, I think that's what really, um, you know, the whole thing about creating strategies that go to scale, that impact the lives of millions, of not billions of people, uh, working with some incredibly talented people, um, and with different skill levels and different skill sets, I think that really appealed to me about McKinsey. So what you mentioned about working with Gates Foundation and 108 and all that, that was part of your uh, McKinsey right. step? Yeah. Okay, um, interesting. So after McKinsey, you uh, immediately uh, went on to do your MBA, or was there some uh, no, so I actually uh, went on secondment from McKinsey to the Public Health Foundation of India. So uh, I don't know how many of you have been following public health and <laughs> tracking public health, uh, you know, policy issues, etc. Anyway, I was I'm, I'm really passionate about healthcare and education. I've always been so. Uh, BHFI actually is a public-private partnership that was started by you know support by McKinsey, Government of India, um, uh, the Gates Foundation, and um, and they were doing some really cutting edge uh, cutting edge research as well as policy work in the public health space in India. And they were fairly new uh, at that point in time, and the president, so the whole anti-tobacco, uh, you know, the smoking ban in public places, so, you know, they were the organization, he was the, like, the president was the, was the brain behind it and was the, the advocate behind it. Um, so that really, again, called out to me, and I said, I want to build up this organization, Let me, and I want to learn, right? It's almost, it was almost a startup at that point in time. And I think what was really interesting about my time there was, um, I was involved in some very sensitive uh, organization restructuring work, right? So what was happening earlier was that the president, because we're a smaller foundation and that's how startups grow, right? You have 50, like earlier you have five people reporting to the CEO or the president in that case. But eventually you have 55, you have 60 people reporting to the president to the CEO, right? So half his or her time is taken up in managing these people who are direct reportees and that's the way they feel they get the influence and power from. And I was brought in to basically sort of figure out what those layers could be without ruffling too many feathers. And people would come up to me and say, hey, so am I going to lose my job? Uh, or am I going to be here but I'm not reporting to Dr. Reddy? So what, like, what is my role anymore? Like, what, what's happening to me? Right? So I think in terms of just like a crash course on being part of an organization and managing people and managing egos and managing fears at many levels, um, I think it was an amazing experience. And I think the second thing that PHFI did really well was um, we were meeting government officials every day. Um, you know, I, uh, we were meeting, um, you know, heads of, um, you know, foundations every day. So, um, and fortunately at McKinsey, like, you know, do you remember I was like, that's like, you know, eight, nine years back, I was much younger. But knowing that I could have a seat at the table and that my ideas are as valuable as any sort of grey-haired man or woman out there, I think that gave me a lot of confidence. Okay. So after that, you even went for your power to yeah. So uh, why did you? I mean, I think you were doing well in your work. Why did you kind of choose to kind of go for a new year? Um, 
I think, uh, so professionally, I, it just gives you so much more credibility. Uh, you know, today when I, um, so I've never been the kind of person who's relied on my, you know, my family net, whatever, like, I mean, not like my family has many networks, but even if they did, like, it's not the, the, the type that, you know, I'm not the type of person to say, hey mom, or hey dad, please introduce me to someone. It's always been like me writing out cold calling, etc. And I think for me to build out my own personal brand, and my own personal street cred, uh, something like a Harvard is uh, has been an incredibly strong brand to to have um, with my name, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat around the bush on that one, right? It is it it really helps open doors. Um, so I think that was one of the you know the professional reasons. Personally, I was really kind of infatuated, I would say, by the fact that Harvard is like Harvard Business School is an amazing place to be, of course. But it's also part of the overall Harvard, the Boston, the Cambridge ecosystem, right? So literally my second year, you would never find me on HBS campus except for the parties. I'd basically be like hopping around, going to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, going to the Harvard School of Public Health, going to the School of Design, going to MIT. So basically just hopping around doing multiple courses, really immersing, talking to undergrads. My God, the Harvard undergrads, some of the smartest people I've met. Um, so just sort of immersing myself in that entire ecosystem environment and, um, and I think that that for me was was incredibly like an incredibly important reason to be uh, part of Harvard the time I was. Okay, interesting. And then uh, uh, you were working after Harvard, you took yes. the job, right? I mean, that was again, I think, consulting. That's right. So I was working with the Brinspan Group in Boston uh, with the understanding, so I went on the Fulbright. So I knew I was moving back to India after a year for sure. Uh, so I, when I, uh, so the, it's interesting. The Brinspan Group doesn't uh, doesn't take international students, uh, and they made an exception in my case. It was very kind of them, and I think, uh, and I was very frank. I said I'm going to be here only for a year. I'm going to immerse as much as I want to, and I'm going to leave, and I'm going to go back to India. And they were like, that's fine with us. Like enjoy this time, learn as much as you want from this time, uh, and I did. Um, so what I was doing there was I was working with. I don't know if you guys have heard of Right to Play. It's an international. Uh, foundation that actually works with uh, building resilience and grit in young children. So anyway, I was working on, on scaling them out um, um, across multiple countries. Um, and I was working with uh, building out influence strategies for a couple of large foundations. Um, I mean, which I can't tell you the names of for reason of confidentiality, but um, so it, was, it was a really cool experience. Okay, interesting. So you did your dog for McKinsey, you know, uh, the health department, then you moved to Howard, did your MBA, work with consulting again. And I know, uh, at the end of it, you kind of decided to come back to India to just start. I mean, what did your family say? Didn't they like ask you, like, are you sane? <laughs> so, they'd given up on me by then. <laughs> but in all honesty, I've, I've never been, um, you know, Mahesh, I've never been a model child or anything at all. I think, uh, on the contrary, so let me just sort of share this with you. Um, and even for folks who want to do an MBA or something later, right? Um, my class 12 marks were nothing to write home about. Uh, my CGPA in law school was was sort of okay. Um, my uh, what else? My GMAT score was was pretty average. Um, so it's I've never been sort of an academically oriented person, and I think that sort of has reflected in. I, and I've always done well at things I really enjoy doing. So um, and so I think by that time my People who knew me best knew that once I make up my mind about something, I'm in it like 195% uh, and nothing can stop me. So uh, when I moved back, like I mean my grandfather still tells my uh, still tells my cousin who studied law at Oxford that when she came down to work with me for a bit at Baby Chakra, she, he was like, don't do the same mistake that Naya's done, you know, figure <laughs> out like, like, don't do this, like look at how much she's struggling. You know, she, we were working out of a house, then around the dining table, he'd come to visit me and he was like, this is your office. So, I get all of that, uh, but people who know me really well know that nothing can stop me when I put my mind to it. Okay, got it. So, who been the biggest support uh, for all through this journey in terms of getting started to be with I'm sure uh, there is always a support by someone which you would count on. So, uh, from family, I would say uh, my mom and my husband. Um, so I think they've just been incredibly amazing pillars of support and in many different ways. My mom's very interfering. So she wants to know every day what's changed at Baby Chakra and I'm like, nothing's really changed. Like this is a slow process. Product takes time to build, traction takes time to build and of course there's an inflection point, right? Um, which she's saying now, so she's, well, I love what's up on the phone calls. 
But, um, but so anyway, but she's been very involved. And my husband actually has been involved in just the other way. So he's always there when I need him. But it's more of me reaching out to him to say, I need like a, a brainstorming session on like these two or three things. Right, so that's where he's helped me out. The other place, by the way, I found a lot of support from is just fellow entrepreneurs. And which is why I think like sessions like this are just the most amazing thing uh, because you realize that, you know, you read all these stories in the newspapers. <laughs> that's not really entrepreneurship. That's the, that happens to a few lucky startups at the end of a long journey, right? What happens in the beginning? That's where we all are today, right? That's what we can talk about and share our experiences on. Interesting. Uh, okay, so now you want to take a while to kind of uh, tell everyone what Baby Chakra is. I don't know how you kind of know. Yeah, please check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah. startup called Baby Chakra, and right now we have a web presence, <coughs> completely mobile responsive, of course. We're coming up with an app, and uh, and I'll tell you more about why we went from sort of web to app. There's there's been a strategic decision behind that. But anyway, uh, so what we do is uh, we help parents discover and decide on local services. And the aim is to eventually help them discover and decide on products as well. Um, and this is right from when you're expecting a baby, so minus nine, to when your child is five. So it's kind of a play on the nine to five, so minus nine to five, so people remember it. Um, and and the, the cool thing about Baby Chakra and the, the tough thing about Baby Chakra has been that we didn't just start off like a classifieds platform, you know, sending people on the street and collecting information and collecting data and listing services on our platform. We actually crowdsourced from thousands of mothers in the cities we are in, right? Which means that about 70% of the services you see profile on our platform, and today we have about 4,500, are actually mom recommended. Which means the quality of the services you see profile on our platform is incredibly high. So if you think about it just strategically and tactically, what is the game we are playing? We are playing the game of credibility, of really providing support to a mother, to a young mother, to a young dad, right? So when you're starting off a venture, I mean, you have two options. You have, and especially when you're a dual-sided player, right? Like, I have my consumers, my mothers, young parents, dads, and you have your customers, local services, brands, etc. When you're young and when you're early, you can play to one of them and you can be sort of the champion for one of them. And we chose to be the champion for the mothers, right? We said, let's, be, let's have a consumer-first approach. Let's give them the best experience they can possibly have. So that's sort of been uh, the reason for the crowdsourcing. Uh, the other thing we're really building out very aggressively, you see a lot of very exciting things on our platform soon, is very strong social integration. So if, as a young parent, if you know if someone's reviewed, so we have you know more than like 2,000 reviews on our platform now on local services. So if if someone has reviewed a particular doctor or a particular play school, uh, you as a registered user user can actually log on the platform and send a message to the reviewer and say, hey, so I see you reviewed Dr. Mahesh Balzekar. Um, you know, I plan to take my child there. Is he really that good as you say he is? Right, the whole tranquilation. And that is, of course, right now through personal messaging, but there are other ways you're building out and you'll see that over time. So, uh, firstly, why the name Baby Chandra? Because of the dot com available. <laughs> and I don't have to pay a million dollars for it. Uh, no, but on a serious note, um, literally it was, um, you know, so the, we schedule a brainstorming session and the other thing I must tell you about my team is that um, initially we could go brainstorming for hours until we realized that now each of our brainstorming sessions we put a hard stop at 35 minutes and we are like, no more. This is it. This is, this is the brainstorming time that we have as a team because there's so much work to be done. But what happened there was uh, we literally took a whiteboard uh, and we sort of wrote out different names. And uh, I was writing on stuff, my co-founder was suggesting stuff, and we were looking at, you know, different, like, checking it out, whether there was a .com available <laughs> to each. It was literally like that. Uh, and then we sort of came up with the name Baby Chakra, and we were like, but actually it fits beautifully, right? If you're thinking of either sort of the circle of um, services, the fact that we want to be a, a support platform for young parents, or if you think about sort of a mother's embrace, like, so many different ways you can look at sort of chakra. Um, the concern of us there was whether it would have sort of international, um, you know, appeal and international relevance. But I think that has, uh, I think, I think it's, that's played out pretty well. Uh, we've had, I mean, mostly Indian expats, but we've had a substantial visitors from the U.S. as well and from uh, the U.K. Um, and from Hong Kong and Singapore. So 
Um, I don't think, I think that sort of uh, fear has been assuaged. And so, uh, if I ask you, what have been your inspiration as to uh, when you came back, when you already had that idea that I want to do this, or you know, what got you into this? Um, so I, so I, for me, it's always been, it's not, never been a question of um, if I will start up. It's always been a question of when. And um, and you know, one thing that so I I tried my hand like at a very very initial level at two startup ideas earlier. Um, one was, you know, I registered a domain name, started working on it, but as I became, it was legalfrack.com. The idea was, you know, again, from my experience in the law school, how to source a good lawyer. Um, you know, and of course, lawyers are not allowed to advertise, so how do you really get to know about a good lawyer? So, um, sort of a network for lawyers, uh, but for consumers to, uh, for, you know, for cl potential clients to interact with lawyers. Um, didn't go very far because, again, you know, it was very early, <laughs> like, the, the whole sort of, the ecosystem and the support systems you have today weren't as robust at that point in time. The second thing I worked on was a, uh, was a platform called College Jow, uh, which was again sort of, uh, you know, reducing information asymmetry around colleges in India. Uh, so I knew there was a Shiksha.com, but I felt that we could do a much better job at, at sort of matching students to, the, to their career tracks and to the colleges that would suit them best. Um, so, I mean, the, basically the underlying theme for whatever I've actually personally loved is a consumer-facing uh, uh, venture. Uh, I'm really fascinated and I and love the idea of building out a brand that people remember and people recognize and, and, and helps people's lives in very, very tangible, substantial ways. And number two, reducing information asymmetry because so much quality differential um, exists in any of the sort of the critical services we uh, consume every day. Um, so how do you remove that? How do you uh, ensure people make great choices, better choices for themselves and for their families and therefore impact their lives in, in, in substantial ways. That's sort of always been the motivation. Um, so when I moved back and I looked at sort of the local services space, the sort of, if I take like a high risk, high trust sort of, you know, two by two, using my consultant hat, uh, the one that was most compelling to me and the one that had a really coherent story, you know, and, and a coherent sort of potential to go to impact was this whole mom, young child space and the local services around it. Um, it was a white space, no one was doing anything about it. Um, and so we were like, we should be the ones changing this and disrupting this space. So, no, I mean, uh, before asking that question, I thought maybe all your friends were married and they were kids, and whenever you met them, they were completely <laughs> so I mean, yes, but um, I think friends complain about so many things. <laughs> so you just have to sort of figure out what you're most passionate about, where. Sort of, it's also sort of opportunity and, and a mix of opportunity and where your passion uh, lies as well, right? Where you want to build out a business. So that is basically the reason. And uh, you have a co-founder for Equity Center, right? So uh, was it like the idea kind of struck both of you together or how was it? I mean, how did you kind of really decide that we should be together to kind of start it? Okay, so first of all, how many uh, entrepreneurs who want to start tech businesses and don't have a tech background here? Okay. Yeah, great. So, um, so yeah, so let me sort of just sort of talk to you a bit about my team right now and I think it'd be helpful to people who don't come from tech backgrounds, right? So I don't have a tech background, I have like this, you know, typical strips. people get paid when I say I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer and a consultant, people hate me. They read it inside, right? But uh, the point being that I don't have a technical background, my co-founder Mitesh, um, and he wanted, he's an ex-banker as well, so he worked in the financial services space. Um, and he was uh, he was leaving banking to actually start up something in the offline kids segment. So he had started the segment well, incredibly bullish about it. Um, and he's a high school friend of mine. Um, so I tr we've trusted each other for the last 16 years. I've known him for the last 16 years, right? So we said let's just try this out, right? So we started off with you know literally launching a Facebook page where nothing ex nothing else existed. Finding out, like, from you know, consumer sentiments, what people were looking for, what we, what posts people were engaging with, well, um, you know, what uh, questions were being asked to us through the Facebook, like, literally, it was free, right? Um, and then over time, we kind of outsourced our initial product to um, to this really uh, to this to this company in uh, in Bombay, um, and they built, you know, I don't know how many of you, I'm sure many of you have read Eric Ries, right? Uh, the lean startup. 
Um, this was the leanest of the leanest of the lean alpha product that could be out in the market. But what helped us do, and we, we spent very little money on it, we spent a lot of time on it, uh, it was out. We just launched really fast, as fast as we possibly could, just to understand what were people engaging with, how was word spreading, uh, what was working, what was not working, building our sort of street cred also with the businesses that we were dealing with, the brands we were working with, right? And as we saw traction grow, our team, we got amazing folks writing in saying they want to be part of the team. So right now, while we were two co-founders to start up with, we actually are a core team of four people. So Madesh and I, Himanshu, who takes care of the entire sort of their back end, he used to work, he used to be part of the early team at Quicker. And Mohit, who's an IIT Delhi grad, worked at Somato, um, and is incredibly familiar with sort of social integration on mobile as well as web platforms. So, I mean, just, it's what, I want to put all of this in context, the fact that as a non-tech founder, non-tech co-founder, don't lose hope and don't wait till you have that tech co-founder on your roles or with you, right? Start off because people will join you if they see the passion, the conviction and the traction. That's very interesting. Uh, so your team, I mean, when you started with just two of you, right? And so how were the initial few days and you said you launched with the Facebook, just the Facebook page. How was really the first interaction with the customer? How was the difficult just kind of elaborate a little bit on that? So, um, I would say the first few days were just this heady excitement. Um, it was like falling in love. <laughs> I mean, really. And I see a lot of like nods there and smiles there. You guys, you guys get it. It was like, yeah, we're building out the best thing ever. We're going to change lives. People are going to love us at sight. Uh, people are going to disrupt everything. It didn't really work out like that. <laughs> we're still learning. We're still growing. Um, but the first few days, I'll tell you what kept us going. Talk to your consumers, get out, like go out, schedule coffee chats with them, go to their homes, go meet them where they are, where they sort of, what are their watering holes, go hang out with them, be part of them. I'm not a mother myself, right? So there was, this, there was actually a learning curve for me. I thought, oh, it's a women-oriented product, I get it. It's very different. You have to understand messaging that works. You have to understand what your brand, what your identity stands for. You have to understand what really resonates and what people remember, right? Uh, and initially, like literally with the two of us there, and the two of us are Baby Chakra, right? Um, people remember you uh, as Baby Chakra, right? So you are the best salesperson for the idea, for the vision, for the product that you intend to create, and people will, will join you if they believe in you. Um, so I think that, so my first set of consumer interactions are more about sort of telling people about, you know, my background, myself, why I want to do this, uh, and, and, and actually listening to them. So I would say if I were to split up my time in, in chats, it would be like, you know, like a 6%, a, a 6 to 8% sort of talking about maybe each other vision, uh, but that would be after I'd listen to my consumer uh, in that one hour long conversation. And that's where I really spend my time. So uh, this is how, how many months back uh, was this? We registered as a company in February uh, last year, uh, and that's when we actually started working as well. Okay, so February 2014 yeah. to now March 2015. Yeah. Uh, what has been the growth? What's the situation today? So we've grown. Um, so from our alpha product, we've grown like 35x <laughs> yeah. in terms of traction. Uh, we um, we are we we technically call ourselves pre-revenue. Uh, because we focus on the consumer, um, sort of, you know, creating credible experiences for the consumer early on. Uh, but that said, we are close to um, signing two big deals with two major brands, and uh, so we should be doing pretty well. So. Uh, we are in two cities, in Bombay and Bangalore. Uh, like I said, four and a half thousand services. Uh, we have, uh, um, you know, registered uh, um, user base of about 25,000 people uh, who get access to our newsletters uh, as well as sort of use our platform. So it's, um, it's, it's growing, uh, and it's growing really fast. But I mean, of course, like the effort is on to push it to grow much faster. So how do you, uh, if I were to track, or how do you track your business? I mean, for you, it's about registered users, or the amount of interaction that you're doing? I mean, what do you really track, and how are you pushing it further? So we track on two metrics. 
a business like ours, now every every business will have their own metrics to track, right? So uh, this is not, of course, universally applicable. Uh, the metrics I track are the number of visitors I get on my platform every month. Yeah, and I also look at um, sort of the engagement levels that they have with the product. Okay. Right. Uh, so that's what I track from the consumer side, and that's sort of been my main focus so far. Uh, but it's large. Like if I think my prior, like my primary metric, it's the number of pe people who use our platform every month. And uh, you track like you know how many consumers are using like you know how often are so if somebody would come just once a month and just move out versus somebody coming every week and you know kind of doing that. So we uh, so we have some basic tools in place that help track the repeat engagement and you know sort of cohort analysis and all of that. Uh, but uh, what we're trying to do is actually get a couple of levels deeper. Mm -hmm. So building out our own user tracking module uh, uh, backend where we can actually track where the person. Um, you know, really engage with our platform, um, you know, uh, what their sort of engagement rates were, uh, you know, through the content or through the different local services. So, over time, what we're trying to do is not just track for the sake of track tracking, but for the sake of improving our platform um, and, and getting better at what we do. Now, uh, I think, uh, so in terms of your target segment, which is like moms now, you know, after having the baby, I think pretty much all their time is in terms of taking care of uh, the baby. How do you really thought of marketing to them? Because, you know, getting their time and attention, uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't think ways in terms of how you can market them. So what did you talk about marketing to them and how do you do that? So one of the busiest people in the world, person in the world, is a young mother. <laughs> she is incredibly busy, right? And I think what these consumer conversations and these coffee chats help us understand was when she gets some time off or when she's sort of you know looking for stuff, where does she go, right? And that for us was sort of a starting point for engaging with her. So I mean, mothers are on, of course, on social media. They are on Facebook. They are part of you know these large Facebook groups, etc. They're also on WhatsApp, of course, right? Um, but also. What we realized was that there were these local mom influencers, online and offline, right? So some mothers who were incredibly vocal and who uh, sort of influenced decision making. Um, so what we tried to do was actually identify who those people were, uh, both online and offline, right? And we reached out to them. And we sort of co-opted them. So we have something called a mom stars um, initiative where we actually have about 10 mothers in Bombay, like 10 really influential mothers in Bombay and 10 really influential mothers in Bangalore um, who work, whose, whose basic sort of job profile or whose basic role is to engage with and promote baby chakra, right? So we actually said, you know, word of mouth works really well, but how do we structure and organize word of mouth, right? So that's what we started off doing. Uh, the other thing, of course, we realized was, again, you know, sort of deriving from just strategies of influence. Uh, there are certain influencers, some of them are already very crowded, like I mean a, a doctor, like a pediatrician or a gynecologist, these are very, very crowded platforms, right? But there are other watering holes. So for instance, at a, um, you know, your play school principal or your play school teachers, or let's say you go to, um, you know, an activity center and the person who sort of organizes the activities over there, Right, so these are also in, in, in subtle ways influencers and they can tell, they can sort of tell people and tell moms about hey baby chakra exists, you know about this, right. The second thing we did was, so this is sort of the, taking the word of mouth and sort of really structuring it and organizing it. The second thing we did was um, figure out, you know, if we be really, really smart about how we spend our money and as a startup you're, uh, you know, you, you have to be very, very careful about, you know, getting maximum sort of ROI on your, on where you're spending money, on where you're spending money. We said, what are the high footfall areas and how do we celebrate them and incentivize them to talk about baby chakra? So we identified a bunch of those, right? So for instance, um, uh, you know, re child-friendly restaurants, uh, activity centers, play schools, preschools, of course, doctors' chambers. Um, and what we did was we actually had a vote uh, among the mothers that we had on our platform. And we said, these are sort of the mom choice awardees. And we gave these centers, so about 65 centers in Bombay, a certificate which is a beautifully designed certificate, cost us all of 150 rupees. Uh, and we deliver them at these centers, and they actually hang in pride of place at these centers, right? These, like this is literally when we are like, what, a four and a half, five month old idea, right? 
um, that so all the sort of um, uh, you know play schools and preschools started you know like my, my co-founder would go to deliver because he was saving on delivery boy expenses and just generally to sort of build a relationship and he said no can we take a photo with you <laughs> handing over the certificate right and I take a photo put it up on the social media it's up on people's uh, websites as well saying that we got a certificate from baby chakra acknowledging us as one of the mom's favorite sort of things in town right wow. so that really I think uh, sort of we leveraged a lot as well yeah, that's interesting I mean, that's really a very different ways of marketing uh, the traditional that, uh, you know, do that. so that's very interesting so let's talk about a little <coughs> on the teams how big is the team now and you know who, do, who does what what is you what that you really take so we are about a 12-member full-time team, uh, and plus we have a, a bunch of folks who work with us part-time who are amazing. Um, so I mean, there's the core team, like I said, is uh, is me, Nitesh, Himanshu, Mohit, um, and I think uh, we've divided our roles really well. So things work very smoothly, even when like you know I'm at places like this, <laughs> chatting with really exciting people. So I love my role. Um, uh, the other uh, folks in the team, uh, so we have uh, you know Rashi who joined us from ILS Pune, um, and she's sort of helping out, you know, sort of build out sort of brand and, and business development. Um, um, we have Priya who is actually next uh, banker, uh, is a mom herself. She leads user engagement for us. The whole Mom Stars program I talked about. She's the one who's sort of coordinating with each and every mother, uh, and also their extended networks. Um, and she sort of led it through both Bombay and Bangalore, which is amazing. Um, we also have a data entry team, um, and it's led by Nena. And the interesting thing about Nena is that when she joined our team, this is literally when you're working out of my dining room in, at home. Um, and so when Nena joined, she didn't have a, a, you know, an email account, she didn't have a social media account. And now she's sort of <laughs> sending me emails left, right, center. She's like this guru on Excel. Uh, she knows sort of the back end beautifully. She sort of coached the other four people we have doing data entry. Uh, and she's really, really stepped up. Um, so it's been fabulous to sort of see people grow with us uh, through the journey. Um, and then we have of course folks doing uh, data entry. We also have an in-house development team who works and, and, and works very closely with both Himanshu and Mohit. Okay. So uh, you said how many of uh, <coughs> members of your team are moms? Uh, so we have, um, uh, we have three people who are moms. Okay. One of them is a developer, so women who code, yay. Uh, <laughs> one of them is, uh, is Priya, who I refer to, who does user engagement. So she understands the users very well because she's one of them. Uh, and we get a lot of sort of these long emails at like 2 a.m. in the morning saying, oh my god, there are bugs here, this is messed up, this, is, this needs to be fixed. So it's amazing sort of having someone on the team who's, who gets the product intuitively. Uh, we also have a part-time social media um, consultant who works out of Delhi. She's a mom herself, and so the posts that you see up on our Facebook page, um, I think she really understands and gets, um, you know, what women really engage with, just, okay. just very beautifully. Uh, but that said, we are actually looking to hire, so we're looking for folks to help us, uh, to actually join us and grow with us full time on UI UX. Um, so I will chat with a few of you, and also on digital marketing. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in joining a really Fast growth startup, trying to disrupt things and sort of shake things around. Uh, please talk to me. Interesting. So, you know, in India, what I've realized is that unless you're making revenues, people don't take you very seriously in the beginning. Uh, but when you're trying to be a credible player, especially in the space that we are in, uh, where literally parents have have grown up like either using word of mouth uh, or using Baby Center or one of the more sort of you know decade-old established platforms. You, and we're sort of us using sort of a consumer first approach and saying we're going to focus on quality and not on commercials early on. Uh, Madesh really helps sort of say that, <coughs> Naya, just look at the light, like look at the emails we get from the mothers on a daily basis, look at the calls we get from them, right? Like that is what we need to celebrate. Uh, money will come because we're doing things, we're clearly doing things the right way. So I think just having that sense of perspective and that sense of what are we really doing this for? And if you're on the right track, I think a co-founder really uh, works with you to help you stay on course. But the other other side to uh, having a co-founder is that <coughs> no two people think alike, and you can have <laughs> you know difference of opinion, even a uh, different kind of a vision to what you kind of really look for. How do you deal with uh, such situation? I'm sure I mean they would be uh, such. How do you deal with such situation? 
so we've had uh, we've had times of great friction, um, and that's normal. Um, and I think it's great if you have times of great friction because that means you have someone who's really invested, passionate in the product, in passion, the vision, as passionate as you are, and wants it to improve, right? Um, so I think that those actually sometimes have been the times where we've come out with, like we've had a major sort of, you know, uh, argument or a major sort of, uh, you know, a very heated conversation on certain product features, where should that go, how should it be, what purpose will it serve? But I think if you structure it well, the outcome of it all can be something that really drastically improves your product. Um, the other thing that we've done, just in terms of now that we are growing bigger, we have a bigger team, things like that, is that we sort of segmented responsibilities. So there's certain things that I take a call on, uh, and you know, parts of the product, pieces in the marketing, some key decisions in hiring, and there's certain things that he completely has the takes the call on, and I don't, I have no, I mean, I don't question him unless I really feel strongly about it. So things around how the team operates internally, uh, how the data entry process is going, how we deal with local services, um, you know, so the final say on the LOPs we create to work with businesses. So, um, so we sort of, you know, divided our work quite neatly over time. And I think uh, that's one thing that, as a young startup, initially you'll be rolling up your sleeves and doing everything, but as you grow, uh, leverage as much as you possibly can, and, and don't get involved in everything because. It's a waste of your time and your potential to really grow the business in the things you are best at. Right. So yeah, that, that's interesting. So you know, uh, uh, we should know of their strengths and weaknesses, and I think between the two, whoever's stronger on one part uh, takes up the other thing. So that that's that's really uh, good. Uh, now let's talk about. I think you know, of late, I have heard maybe Chakra again featured at a couple of things, like you know, Google Launchpad and. Exhibit uh, thing and also I think you know just list down a, a one where you got featured and uh, how do these things really helping you and how do you kind of end up being there? So that's that's good to know. Yeah, so we've actually been very fortunate. So in a very uh, quick period of time, so today we won CNBC Young Turks. I don't know if you guys got us. Uh, we were there for not very long, but we were there. Um, and uh, so Exhibit, we were sort of uh, you know uh, we were the second hottest startups, tech startups of 2014, 2015. Which is Quite amazing. Uh, Wharton, uh, we were sort of five of the startups called to pitch uh, from India among, I don't know, the 1,500 applications that they had, and we placed runners up. Uh, Google Launchpad was an amazing experience. It was a five day, very intensive program. Uh, they selected 20 startups from across India uh, to be part of this mentorship and coaching session, uh, all by Googlers as well as sort of folks at Yahoo, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, so, like amazing experiences uh, in coaching, in, in meeting peers, in learning from what other people are doing. Um, so I would say that two things that I really feel this has helped us, like, that we've gotten out of these experiences. Number one, just like I said, I mean, just the fact, the fabulous mentors that we've cultivated over time, the fabulous uh, peers that we've met and learned from, and the fact that there's so much scope for collaboration, even um, you know, with startups, so for instance, you know, a bunch of women-centric businesses, how do you sort of leverage each other's platforms? Like, if you're trying to talk to the same consumer, why not grow together, right? So I think a lot of these platforms help you connect with, uh, you know, the same audience-minded uh, startups. Um, the second thing is, I mean, of course, it creates a lot of buzz in the community. Uh, you know, you get access to a lot of uh, resources. Uh, you also get a lot of credibility with your, uh, with brands and with, and with services because, you know, they've either read about you in the news or, they feel that okay, you know, there's a stamp of uh, you know credibility of merit to the startup. Uh, it kind of differentiates you from the rest of the pack. And I mean, well, actually, it's the two points, but actually the three. Uh, and the third thing is a steam morale, right? Um, so you know, imagine yourself. I mean, so many of you are entrepreneurs, so you know what it's like, right? You reach the place of work, or if it's at home, whatever. You reach your place of work in the morning. Um, you know, you are constantly looking at how much funds you have left. You're looking at sort of you know Google Analytics data to see whether people actually use your platform. Um, you're you know always on calls trying to sell, 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 uh, grow, 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 and your team is actually bearing like most of that is doing most of that along with you, right? So for for the team to be to feel part of that there's something part of something bigger and something that's getting the due sort of the, their efforts are getting acknowledged. I think a lot of these awards go a long way. And you know we have a sort of a mini team celebration anytime something like this happens. 
Um, so I think it goes a long way in boosting a team's morale and, and, and you know, making them feel they're part, of some, they're part of something big and something that's getting bigger over time. So uh, let me ask you a last question, I think then I'll let everyone ask because I think there will be more questions uh, there with people. So, uh, so it's been a quite a journey, I mean, like, even after hearing so, you know, from your law to kind of till now. Uh, what are the probably two, three things which you think you have learned by doing all of this, which is what you probably every day apply in your work or what really keeps you going or, you know, the days when you kind of really go. But what really keeps you going? Uh, I think what, I mean, I'll tell you personally, what really keeps me going is the fact that I get emails and I get, you know, instant messages from people who use our platform. And and I've got gotten some really personal messages. So, uh, for instance, mothers who, um, I mean, uh, that, that's not core, that's not bread and butter for our business in terms of introducing them to lactation consultants, but mothers who didn't know how to breast, like who could breastfeed their children and on our platform they discovered the idea of a lactation consultant and they said that now I can actually breastfeed my child, you're giving me access to resources I didn't even know existed, right? And I've gotten very emotional emails from them. So I think uh, also with local services, so the other day, it was, it was actually a day of celebration at our office, so uh, we got back-to-back -back chocolates. Uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, a baby photographer who got as many as six orders from our platform in in, 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 us in two months. So she came uh, to the office with her son and her husband with a box of chocolates saying, I love baby chakra, you know, I want to pump up my package uh, and sort of how do I go up the subscription package. Uh, and like literally, like two hours after that, I got a call from a uh, del delivery person downstairs saying that I've gotten chocolates from, for, for your team from a young mother who just given birth <laughs> and she was part of our, uh, our, our user database and she sort of used a lot of the resources and she sort of sent us her, you know, chocolates is thanking baby chakra, right? So, I mean, so I think things like that really keep us going. Um, in terms of lessons I apply every day uh, and for me personally, um, just put yourself out there. Uh, you never know where an opportunity comes. You. You don't know where you meet that, that, that person who actually becomes a very critical part of your team or sort of joins you as a mentor or joins or, or you know there are partners out there that you can collaborate with. So just put yourself out there. Um, you know, start early, launch early, launch with a, a buggy product, launch with a basic product, but understand from the consumer what they are looking for because don't sort of start off with assumptions. I mean you can of course start off with assumptions, but like test those assumptions constantly and improve and iterate, right, based on also what you hear from consumers. So just launch early, launch fast, fail fast, learn fast. Um, and the third thing is, your team is incredibly important. I mean, this is, all of us hear that, all of us say that, but it's, it's, it's actually what makes, uh, a, you know, a vision a reality. Um, and when, and I think a lot of people forget that a team is actually people. Uh, they have their own vision, they have their own dreams, they have their own ways of working and functioning um, and they have their own motivations, right? And I think early on as a founder, spending time understanding what their motivations are, understanding what drives them and how you can create an atmosphere for them to really have them given their 100% is incredibly important because then that percolates, right? So Nena, like I told you guys about, uh, the data entry lead, we understood her really well and the, the way she leads her team now, her mini team now, we're actually completely hands off. It's, it's all been delegation, right? So as you grow and as you, as you sort of start off, I mean, start off to grow. Don't start off just to be transactionary with people and with partners and with, with whatever you're doing at that point in time. Mm -hmm.